Um, you can hear me, correct? All right, let's go. So good morning, everyone. I am Sean Renee, and on behalf of SEED, the Center for Early Intervention on Deafness, I wanna welcome you to part two of our audiology webinar series, audiograms and amplification. If you miss part one of the series, Understanding Hearing and Hearing Differences, you can watch it on our YouTube channel. Simply search SEED Berkeley, okay? Today we have a few available features and I would like to share those with you. And I'm gonna run through them just so you can see them. Dun, da, da, da. So we like to welcome you again. Um, we have a Q&A at the bottom. We're gonna be taking questions. If you can type them into the Q&A box, that would be helpful. We will track them and we're gonna answer questions at the end. Um, if you have any technical issues, you wanna share something, please also put that in the chat box and we will try to get back to you as soon as we possibly can. Um, next slide. We also have closed captioning. At the bottom on your toolbar, there will be live captioning. You simply click the CC box and it will um, show you captioning. So if you want to follow along that way, that would be um, fantastic. In addition, if you need language interpretation, if you requested a, an interpreter, we have this little section down here. Um, you just click on the globe and you will see your options that are available and there should be a live interpreter there. If you want to just hear the interpreted language and not the original language, select mute original audio. And that way you'll only hear the selected section that you asked for. Okay. And I think that's it for that. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to... Um, talk about today's topic. It's audiograms and amplification. The purpose of this webinar is to help you better understand that little graph on your, on your um, audiogram reports or your audiology reports, all those little X's and O's and what they mean. So we're gonna draw, and then we're also gonna dive into like different types of amplification devices. So let me move this out of my way. With that said, I want to reintroduce you to our um, occupational audiologist, Cookie. And Cookie, I'm gonna add this pin and pop you right in. Okay, and if you can unmute yourself and introduce yourself and we will get this webinar on its way. All right, thank you so much, Sean Renee. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. All right, let's get rolling. I'm gonna share my screen. Share presentation. All right. All right, good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Welcome to Audiology Part 2, Audiograms and Amplification. As Sean Renee said, I'll be sharing some basic information about how to read that graph on the audiogram, how to derive meaning from it, as well as some basic information about how different types of amplification work. Before we get started, I'd like to thank you for all of the time and effort and love that you're all putting into supporting our children with hearing differences. Thank you also for taking the time to be here, to listen, and to ask questions. A, a reminder from your friendly neighborhood audiologist to remember to take care of yourself, do whatever you need to do that will bring you joy and peace to help refill your cup. The task that you have of supporting our kids is no small ask. So just remember to also take the time to honor yourself and give yourself that 
space to refill your cup. Next, I'll introduce myself, but while I'm doing that, I'd like to invite you all to think about any burning questions that you already have about the audiogram, whether it's reading it, what do the symbols mean, what does the whole thing mean in general, any questions that you're coming to this webinar with, please feel free to just put them in the Q&A right away. I want to cater this presentation to the people that are here right now. So your questions will help me to know what to focus on and kind of give me a lay of the land. A reminder that all of the questions in the Q&A should be anonymous. So as Sean Renee said, my name is, is Cookie. My real name is Kuiulani Moku Paiva, but my patients and colleagues call me by my nickname, Cookie, just like the food. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I strongly believe that all communication is good communication, regardless of the method, whether it's ASL, verbal, total communication, et cetera. I strongly believe that the best method is whatever method works the best for each individual family. There's no right or wrong way to communicate. I'm the clinical and educational audiologist here at SPEED. When I'm in clinic, I perform hearing assessments, help patients to fit and manage their amplification devices. But my favorite part of my work is when I get to provide educational audiology support services to our SEED students, their families, and our amazing group of staff um, and therapy professionals here at SEED. I also really enjoy serving as the audiologist on IEP teams for students at other schools because in that capacity, I get to collaborate with other educators and therapists to make sure that our students have all of the supports they need to thrive in whatever educational setting they're in. Prior to becoming an audiologist, I did my undergraduate work in early childhood education and special education, and I taught fourth grade general education. So after attending, or in today's webinar, I my hope is to be able to help to conceptualize the ideas, the concepts, and the language that are used on the audiogram so that it feels accessible and meaningful to you, so that you can feel comfortable using this information, this language with your audiologists, your medical providers, um, and your school and IEP team. So here, these are the objectives for our webinar, for you to be able to read and understand the audiogram, describe three different types of amplification devices, and to understand the impact of your child's hearing level on audibility. And audibility is what they can hear. Okay, before we jump into the new content for today, I'm gonna do a brief overview of our first webinar so that we're all coming into this on the same page here. So, here we see a graphic of the entire auditory system. And the way that hearing works is that sound enters the outer ear or the pinna. It travels down the ear canal, it vibrates the eardrum, and then it vibrates the bones in the middle ear. It causes the fluid and hair cells in the inner ear or cochlea to vibrate. These vibrations create electrical signals. This signal travels through the auditory nerve up to the brain, where the brain then has the huge task of making meaning and assigning meaning to that sound. There are four different types of hearing differences. A conductive hearing difference is when there is a difference in the functioning or the anatomy of the outer ear or the middle ear. A conductive hearing difference can be temporary, such as fluid in the middle ear due to an ear infection, or it can be permanent. For example, um, a child that doesn't have a pinna or an outer ear. The second type of hearing difference is a sensory neural hearing difference. 
that means there is a difference in the inner ear, in the cochlea, or the auditory nerve. A sensory neural hearing difference is permanent. There's also a mixed hearing difference, which is exactly what it sounds like, a combination of both a um, permanent hearing difference in the inner ear, as well as some type of conductive hearing difference, some type of blockage in either the middle ear or the outer ear. It can be, it, it is permanent. The sensory neural part of the hearing, of a mixed hearing difference is permanent, but the conductive component, such as the middle ear fluid, can be temporary. So if your child is given antibiotics or once the middle ear fluid clears, then that conductive component, that blockage, will go away. We also briefly touched on auditory neuropathy, which is a difference that's in either the inner ear here, the auditory nerve, or in the brainstem. And this is a permanent hearing difference. All right, so during a hearing test, the audiologist measures. Their goal is to measure how loud sound needs to be in order for your child to hear it across a range of different pitches or frequencies that are important for understanding speech. The audiogram typically looks something like this. We have a smattering of symbols, X's, O's, brackets, sometimes arrows, and these show your child's hearing levels. There's also typically a tympanogram. A tympanogram tells us if there's any blockage in the middle ear, again, fluid, atypical function of the middle ear, bones, etc., that is dampening sound. So essentially, any blockage in the middle ear lowers the volume of all sounds, so that by the time that this sound arrives in the inner ear, it's much softer than the volume that it was at when it entered the outer ear. Typical middle ear function is indicated by a tracing with a peak, so like a little mountain. In contrast, atypical middle ear function or a middle ear with some type of blockage is indicated by a flat tracing here, like this green line um, with no peak. A flat tracing could also indicate a hole in the tympanic membrane or eardrum. I would like to, oops, I would like to preface our discussion about the audiogram by putting it into the greater context of just life and hearing and what it means. So the audiogram is a tool that can be used to describe a person's hearing level. It is a starting point to determine appropriate supports, to determine if or how much amplification is needed, and it can help to guide decision making around the communication method that you'll choose for your family, whether it's ASL, verbal, or total communication. An audiogram and a child's hearing levels do not determine or predict your child's development. It doesn't predict their language development, their cognitive development, social development. The audiogram alone does not determine any of development in any of these areas. In fact, research shows that it's actually early access to language, whether it's spoken or signed, that is the best predictor of spoken language outcomes. So this means that it doesn't matter if early language is signed, it doesn't matter if it's spoken language, what matters the most is giving your child early access to language of any kind as soon as possible. Okay, so first we'll talk about the different parts of the hearing test, what you typically see when you go into a hearing test appointment. Then we'll orient ourselves to the actual audiogram graph and the jargon that is often used to describe it. And then we'll talk about how the audiogram is used clinically, what to look for to derive meaning about your child's hearing. In other words, what can they hear? What can they not hear? So during the typical hearing test, your child's hearing level 
is measured in two different methods via air conduction, excuse me, and bone conduction. Air conduction is measured via headphones, like this little guy is wearing here. And air conduction essentially presents sound to your child in a similar way to how they hear in everyday life, meaning that sound has to travel through the entire hearing system. So this is my little best attempt at a headphone graphic. The headphone is placed on their outer ear. Sound travels through the outer ear, down the ear canal, through the middle ear, before it passes to the inner ear, through the auditory nerve, and up to the brain. This is air conduction all the way through the entire hearing system. Bone conduction audiometry is different because it's measured using a bone conduction headband behind the ear. And it measures how loud sound needs to be for your child to hear it when sound is played directly to the inner ear. So with bone conduction, here's my little headband here. With bone conduction, sound does not pass through the outer and middle ear first before it arrives at the inner ear. And this is important because as we learned earlier, we know that if there is a blockage in the outer ear, like your child doesn't have an outer ear, or if there's some wax in the ear canal, or if there's a blockage in the middle ear, like fluid, the blockage will dampen sound. And since sound is dampened, it will need to be played at a louder level for your child to be able to detect it or hear it compared to if there was no blockage. So bone conduction audiometry is awesome because it allows us to directly measure your child's hearing level in the inner ear without the sound being dampened by any outer or middle ear blockage. Air conduction hearing levels are then compared to bone conduction hearing levels to determine the type or location of the hearing difference. Is it sensory neural based in the inner ear? Is it conductive due to a blockage? Or is it some combination of the two? So let's orient ourselves to this graph here. So I'm looking at this little sliver here of the audiogram. We have an X, which corresponds to the hearing level of the left ear, and an O, which represents the right ear. The height of these symbols on the audiogram indicate how loud sound needed to be for your child to hear it at this specific tone or frequency. The units of sound intensity, aka volume, are called decibels. And this is the abbreviation on the side, dB, decibels. Smaller numbers are softer sounds and softer sounds, and larger numbers are louder sounds. So on this graph here, negative 10 decibels is the softest sound on the graph, and 120 decibels is the loudest sound. This image here on the right gives some examples of sounds at various intensity levels or volume levels. So leaves rustling is about a 30 decibel sound. A lawnmower, 80 to 89 decibels, and a chainsaw is about 115 decibels. So this just gives us a frame of reference for how loud various sounds are. So an analogy for a hearing test that I like to use is that a hearing test is like a volume dial, slowly being turned up until your child demonstrates that they can hear the sound. So in a hearing test, the audiologist, in theory, would start by turning the volume down as quiet, as low as it can go, okay? So that's at negative 10 decibels. This is the quietest sound that we have on this audiogram. The audiologist will slowly increase the volume of sounds and observes your child's reaction until your child demonstrates that they can hear it. Once your child shows that they can hear it, they mark this level on the audiogram with an X or an O. And this level is referred to as their threshold or hearing threshold level. You'll hear that word a lot in audiology clinics with your ENT threshold levels. So an example 
of this would be when we look at this audiogram here. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Sound was played at negative 10 for this child, did not hear it. Made it louder to zero, child did not hear it. Con the audiologist continued to make sound louder and it was at 15 decibels that this child was able to hear sound in their left ear. And in their right ear, they were able to hear the same tone at 20 decibels. So what you might hear the audiologist say is that at 250 hertz, this child's hearing threshold level in the left ear is 15 decibels and their threshold in the right ear is 20 decibels. On this particular audiogram, this gray shaded region between negative 10 and 15 um, is indicating the range of what is considered to be typical hearing. So the same process of presenting sound at a quiet level and increasing it and increasing it until your child demonstrates their ability to hear it is repeated across the frequency range. What is frequency? Frequency is another word for pitch. So when we're reading the audiogram on the left, we have very low pitch sounds like a bass drum. And as we move to the right, the pitch gets higher and higher and higher until the highest pitch sound that we measure is 8,000 hertz. And you can think of an 8,000 hertz sound as like a bird tweeting or chirping, a very high pitch sound like that. So I marked this particular audiogram with gray lines to show the sounds that are too soft for this child to hear. So any sounds that are quieter than their hearing threshold level, they're not gonna hear. The green lines represent sounds that are audible. Audible means these are sounds that this child will definitely be able to hear. So there are various names for the degrees of hearing difference. And I think that these names were, these categories were created to establish a shared vocabulary for us to be able to dialogue and talk and discuss in general various hearing levels and to give us a, a shared language to use. The names of the degrees of the hearing differences are based on the particular hearing threshold level. So pictured here on the right are the criteria for the various degrees of hearing differences. So typical hearing is considered the ability to hear a sound between negative 10 and 15 decibels. A slight hearing difference is the ability to hear sounds between 20 and 25 decibels, mild 30 to 40 decibels, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, when we look at this child's audiogram at 250 hertz in the left ear, again, the X is for left, their hearing threshold level is at 15 decibels and 15 is considered typical. However, when we move to a thousand hertz, their hearing threshold level is 40 decibels. 40 decibels is considered a mild hearing loss. So the degree of hearing difference will vary depending on the specific pitch or tone that you're referring to or talking about in that moment. All right, this slide is pretty busy, but just stick with me and we'll get through it. So here on the right, this audiogram, you can ignore these X's and O's for now, but this audiogram is what is referred to as the audiogram of familiar sound. And just like that graph that I showed you or that image that I showed you on the previous slide, this audiogram gives us some point of references for just how loud various sounds are and also what pitch those sounds are at. So for example, that high frequency sound, that bird tweet, it is a very high pitched sound at 8,000 hertz, but it's a very quiet sound. A bird tweet is typically at about five to 10 decibels and it's a high frequency sound. Whereas a dripping faucet is a 15 decibel sound. A vacuum cleaner is 55 decibels. A lawnmower is a very loud 95 decibel low frequency sound. 
and an airplane or a rock band is considered very loud 110 decibel sounds. So when we go back to the radial dial analogy, the symbols on the audiogram tell us the volume that your that sound needed to be at in order for your child to just barely detect it. That means that any sounds softer, again, any sounds above their hearing threshold level, they are not able to hear it or detect it. So when we look at this child here at 4,000 Hertz, we started the sound dial down here at zero and the child didn't hear it until the volume was at 30 decibels. This means that all of these sounds here, this whisper, bird chirping, this child is not able to hear those sounds, but they are able to hear these other sounds, vacuum, the motorcycle, because they're louder than their threshold level. These sounds are audible. These sounds are not audible. Another phrase you will likely often hear is speech banana, speech banana. What is the speech banana? The speech banana is this gray shaded region here in the shape of a banana. And I wanna point out these letters because it tells us, this graph tells us about what frequency and about at what volume these various speech sounds are. And this is important because it helps us to understand we, which speech sounds are within your child's range of hearing and which sounds are too quiet for your child to hear. So for example, in this case, for this particular child, sounds like P, H, G, K, all of those very quiet consonant sounds are too quiet for this child to hear. Whereas sounds above their threshold level, mm, d, b, mm, all of these sounds here are loud enough for them to hear. So if I were speaking to this child, and I said the word rap, R-A-P, rap. This child without any amplification would likely hear ra because they can't hear that P sound. So they don't know if I said rap or rag or rack if all they have to go on is sound alone. So if you cannot hear sounds, you cannot learn to produce it. That's why it's very important that if your goal for your child is for them to be able to use spoken language and produce verbal speech, we need to know what sounds they can hear and what sounds they are not able to hear without amplification. That way you can decide how you want to move forward. Would you like to amplify sounds so that they can have access to these speech sounds? Or maybe you don't want to amplify them. You don't want to amplify sound, excuse me, in which case you'll know that without amplification, they're not going to be able to hear or produce these sounds. Okay, so let's get into reading the audiogram and what it tells us about different types of hearing differences. So when we are looking at the audiogram, we are comparing air conduction hearing levels and bone conduction hearing levels to tell us where in the hearing system the hearing difference is. So air conduction hearing levels, again, that's hearing levels that were measured using headphones, are indicated with an X or an O, and bone conduction hearing thresholds are indicated with a left or right arrow. So comparing these two types of hearing threshold levels gives us an understanding of, is this hearing difference due to a blockage in the outer or middle ear, or is it a permanent hearing, hearing difference that is due to a difference in the functioning of their inner ear? When we look at bone conduction thresholds and we see that they are within 10 decibels of air conduction thresholds, so within 10, it means that the hearing difference is in the inner ear. It's not due to some type of blockage. And we know this because typically with blockages, we see bone conduction, these arrows, we see bone conduction thresholds that are 15 decibels or better 
than air conduction threshold. So in general, with a blockage, a child can hear better via bone conduction because the blockage is not dampening that sound. So for example, in this child at 5,000 Hertz, which is the low frequency sound, the right air conduction threshold indicated by the circle is at 20 decibels. The bone conduction threshold, this arrow here, is also at 20 decibels. There is no difference in this child's ability to hear when sound has to pass through the entire hearing system compared to when it goes directly to the inner ear. That means there's no blockage there. And that's what we call a sensory neural hearing difference. A conductive hearing difference, okay? So sometimes bone conduction thresholds are much better, meaning they can be heard, sound can be heard at much lower volumes when presented through bone conduction compared to air conduction. So one thing I just wanna point out with this slide is that sometimes bone conduction thresholds you'll see are indicated by a left or right arrow as in the previous slide. Other times it's indicated by a left or right bracket. And I'm sharing this with you so that when you go to look at your child's audiogram, you'll know that both arrows and brackets do refer to bone conduction. Okay, so when a left or right arrow is used, it means that the tone was presented with no background noise because your child's ability to hear is this, was the same via air and bone conduction. Now, when brackets are used, like in this case, it means that the tone was presented to your child with background noise. And background noise is used when there is a difference in hearing between ears or when there is a difference in hearing um, via bone conduction and air conduction. All right, so now that we know that bone conduction symbols can be either brackets or arrows, let's take a look at what's going on here. So first we'll start by looking at this child's hearing levels when sound was presented via bone conduction. The left and the right brackets show us that when sound was presented via bone conduction directly to the inner ear, this child was able to hear sound within the range of typical hearing. And again, that range for typical is between negative 10 and 15 decibels for kids. So bone conduction thresholds are within the range of typical. However, when sound was presented to this child via air conduction through the headphones, so all the way through the outer, middle, and inner ear, sound needed to be much louder for them to just barely be able to hear it compared to bone conduction. So in this case, when a 500 Hertz low frequency tone was played to this child via air conduction, they needed the sound to be at a level of 40 decibels for them to be able to hear it. So again, why is this child able to hear sound at a lower level when it's presented through bone conduction? What is the deal? Why is there a difference? Remember that bone conduction sends sound straight to the inner ear and air conduction has to pass through the outer ear and middle ear. So this child, with this child, there is likely some type of blockage that is dampening sound as it passes through the outer or middle ear. Sound needs to be louder because the sound needs to be loud enough to overcome whatever that blockage is. It needs to power through, power around that earwax, that fluid in order to finally make it to its final destination of the inner ear. And a mixed hearing loss is a combination of a bone conduction and air conduction hearing difference, excuse me, mixed hearing difference. So let's again, start by looking at the child's hearing levels when sound was presented via bone conduction. These left and right brackets here show us that they are able to still hear sound at a much softer level via bone conduction compared to air conduction. However, the bone conduction hearing levels are also outside of the range of typical hearing. In the 
in the previous slide, the bone conduction hearing levels were within the range of typical hearing, <clears throat> excuse me. But here in this case, the bone conduction is outside of the range of typical, which means that there is a hearing difference in the inner ear, which is sensory neural, a sensory neural hearing difference. But because there is also this difference in ability to hear via air conduction, they needed sound to be louder when it was presented via air conduction. It means that there's something blocking the sound that's preventing this child from being able to hear sound at this level of 30 decibels when it's played via air conduction. So in this case, this child's bone conduction thresholds in the left and the right ear are at 30 decibels, whereas their air conduction thresholds in the left and right ear are at 70 decibels. That's how loud they needed sound to be in order to hear it. All right, I'm gonna keep on going to briefly describe amplification devices to make sure we get through everything. I do see a question in the Q&A and I'll be sure to um, read that as soon as we're finished. Okay, before we get into amplification, I just wanna preface this by saying that amplification, all types of amplification, whether it's hearing aids, air conduction hearing aids, bone conduction hearing aids, cochlear implants, are a tool to give your child access to sound. Amplification does not restore typical hearing. Okay, so this is very different than glasses. A person has blurry vision, they can't see quite right, you put on glasses and it's good as new. Hearing is not like that at all. So amplification is great. It's still a tool. It makes sound loud enough for your child to be able to hear. But it's important to keep in mind that even though sound is louder, it's still being processed by an auditory system that is not quite functioning typically. And what this can mean is that sound can sometimes be distorted. It's not as clear as it would be for a person with typical hearing. Also important to keep in mind is that your child is still hearing sound through a speaker. So we, when we think about just the quality of sound when it's coming through a speaker, that's a very different quality of sound than when you're speaking or listening to somebody <clears throat> in real life. So there's that additional layer of sound quality on top of this distortion that is important for us to keep in mind when having realistic expectations of what we're thinking our kids are hearing. Um, ampl hearing aids and cochlear implants cannot replace the human brain. So unfortunately, we cannot connect hearing aids and cochlear implants to our brains, which means that we cannot direct our hearing aid or cochlear implant and tell it what exactly we want to hear. We can't direct it to amplify the voice of mom while lowering or paying less attention to the background noise. So hearing aids essentially and cochlear implants essentially guess what sound you want to hear and what sounds you want to be reduced. How does the hearing aid decide which sound to amplify and which sound to decrease? One way it decides is based on direction. So sometimes, depending on how the hearing aid is programmed, it will amplify the sound that is coming from in front, in front of it. So this works sometimes, like when the person your child is trying to listen to is directly in front of them, or you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation and you're facing face-to-face -face with your child. But it doesn't work so well when they're trying, when the person that they're trying to listen to is to their left or to their right, as in this teacher who is sitting in a circle with her students. She is to the left and to the right of many of these students but their hearing aid could be amplifying what is directly in front of them, excuse me, which is another student. Another way that hearing aids decide what to amplify is by simply amplifying whatever the loudest sound is around it in the environment. If 
thinks, well, that sound is the closest to me. It's the loudest, so it must be most important. Again, sometimes this works, but not always. So think of an example of maybe a parent who is calling their child from 10 feet away, not that far away. But if a child is sitting next to the TV that is louder than the parent's voice, your hearing aids are amplifying the sound of the TV and essentially dampening or lowering the volume of the parent's voice because it's farther away. So the hearing aid is guessing that that farther away voice is not what I want to hear. So it, I, I really want us all to keep in mind that even when wearing amplification, listening in the presence of multiple talkers, like sitting around the dinner table with family or um, in a classroom discussion, story time, play time, even when wearing amplification, listening in the presence of multiple talkers or background noise is always going to be hard. Listening at a distance as well is going to be hard because you're depending on amplification and the guessing of the amplification to correctly guess what you want to hear and what you want to not hear and what you want to reduce. And, you know, it's doing its best, but it's not perfect. And sometimes amplification will not get it right. Here are um, a few tips for creating a language rich environment for your child. So as I mentioned earlier, early access to a language rich environment is so important to developing language. And again, it doesn't matter whether that early language access is via ASL, spoken language or both. So a language rich environment looks like surrounding your child with role models that are fluent in spoken language or ASL. If you're choosing to go the ASL route, it looks like constantly talking and signing with your child, even if they're too young to respond to you, still engage with them, still sign with them, still talk to them. And even when you are speaking to other people, it's a good idea if you're teaching your child to sign to still sign with other people, even when you're not interacting with your child, so that they can watch, they can observe, they can take in all of that information, even when it's not directed, being directed toward them. Um, below here is a website um, uh, from Lead K Family Services with some awesome suggestions on um, language acquisition, how to build a strong language foundation for your kids, especially in using sign language. So I highly encourage um, y'all to check out this website. There's so many great resources here. All right, so hearing aids, we are going to talk about two different types of hearing aids. Um, as I mentioned earlier, hearing aids work by taking in sound from the environment, guessing what it is you want to hear, and amplifying it to a level that is audible for your child. Again, hearing aids do not restore typical hearing. So keep in mind that even though your child may be wearing hearing aid, what they hear is not the same as what you hear. Also very important to keep in mind is that your child has to work a lot harder to listen and understand speech than a typical, than a person with typical hearing. And it gets tiring. So just have some grace with your kids, especially if at the end of the day, they're just needing a listening break. Give them a listening break. They're working really hard all day. So we have air conduction hearing aids, which is what this person here is wearing. They typically sit behind the ear. There's an ear mold that goes into the ear canal. And this sends sound through the entire auditory um, system. We also have bone conduction hearing aids, which this person here is wearing. And rather than sending sound through the ear canal, bone conduction works like the bone conduction headband used for testing. Bone conduction hearing aids work by transforming sound from the environment into vibrations, which are sent directly into the inner ear. Bone conduction devices are used when a child has a blockage in the outer, a permanent blockage in the outer ear, 
like an absent outer ear or no opening to the ear canal, like um, the girl in the photo. It can also be used when a child has an ear that is just constantly draining due to chronic ear infections, or if there are other middle or outer ear differences that don't make a conventional air conduction hearing aid feasible. In kids, a bone conduction hearing device is worn on a headband, and in older age, a screw can be surgically implanted so that the hearing aid can directly snap on to the head without having to wear a headband. A cochlear implant is a surgically implanted device for individuals with a severe to profound hearing difference. A cochlear implant is an option when the degree of hearing difference is so great that the sound from a hearing aid would have to be so loud for your child to be able to hear it that the sound would just be completely distorted, causing the speech sounds that are going in to the hearing aid just to be indiscriminable. A cochlear implant has two parts, the internal processor and the external processor. The external processor is worn behind the ear and kind of looks like a large hearing aid. The internal implant is placed just under the skin um, on the side of the head. And this tiny electrode array here is sent, is surgically implanted into the inner ear and wrapped around the cochlea there. So the way that it works is that the external sound processor, which sits on the outside of the ear, picks up sound from the environment like a hearing aid. But where it differs is that it picks up this sound, it converts it into a digital signal, which is then sent across the skin to this internal component here which then sends the sound down into the internal ear canal and stimulates the hearing nerve and sends sound to the brain that way. All right, we made it. <laughs> so in summary, an audiogram is a tool. It's a tool for describing your child's hearing level. It's a starting point to determine appropriate supports, to determine if amplification is needed, how much amplification is needed, and it can help to guide conversations around decision-making about which communication method is gonna fit best for your family, whether ASL, verbal, or total communication. An audiogram and the child's hearing levels do not determine or predict your child's language development. There is nothing to show that hearing levels alone directly impact language or cognition. Rather, it is that early access to a language-rich environment, whether sign language or spoken language, that is the best predictor of spoken language outcomes and just language outcomes in general for your child. And again, if spoken language is your goal for your child, and you decide to pursue amplification, it's important that amplification be used during all waking hours to give your child as much exposure to language, to sound, to interactions as possible, while keeping in mind that they are doing so much work, their brains are working really hard to process all of that language, and if they need a listening break, go ahead and give them a listening break. They, they deserve it. <laughs> All right, so that is all that I have. I'm gonna head over to the Q&A and the question says, how do audiologists calibrate hearing aids? How do audiologists know when hearing differences change versus minor calibrations? Great question. So the best measure that we have for when a child's hearing changes is by doing by doing a new hearing test, seeing what their hearing levels are like on that particular day, and then comparing it to what their hearing levels were like on a different day. That's just a very apples to apples direct comparison. Um, the other, your other question about calibrating hearing aids. So 
Um, hearing aids are calibrated using um, equipment in our office. And when we are calibrating it, we are looking to see how is the hearing aid functioning compared to the specs, essentially, the manufacturer specs. When we get a new hearing aid, the manufacturer will tell us this is exactly how much output, how much sound this hearing aid should producing, should be producing. And then we can run the hearing aid through our equipment and compare how is this hearing aid performing compared to what the manufacturer says a brand new hearing aid um, should be performing. And then we can compare the two to determine if the hearing aid is not functioning properly, in which case it needs to be repaired or if the hearing aid is functioning properly, but there's, your child is still not understanding speech as clearly or as well as we would expect them to, then we would look at their hearing levels and get an updated hearing test to determine if, um, determine if that's been a change. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Okay, Cookie, can you hear me? Is yes, I can. In? Okay, that's great. We do have one more question. We are running against the clock. So I'm going to read this one. Um, this person is wondering what you would typically recommend when having difficulty getting reliable behavioral audiograms. And they give an example. Their two and a half year old gets pretty upset during hearing tests. Um, they see the audiologist every few months but they're getting, they are having trouble getting reliable audiograms. The results mm -hmm. indicate that his hearing difference is more important than we, uh, more important than we thought, but it is tough to know whether it reflects an actual hearing difference or lack of cooperation during the test. And it says we are recommended to do an ABR. So what say you? Great question. This is such a tricky, situation. I really feel for you because you are concerned about your child's hearing. You want to make sure that they have access to language, but without knowing specifically what their hearing levels are, it kind of puts us at a, at a pass. How do we move forward here without having a clear understanding of what they're able to hear? Um, it's good to see that you guys are seeing your audiologist regularly. So there have been, it sounds like there have been multiple attempts at getting a behavioral, um, a behavioral hearing test and it's just not working and that's okay. Your child is doing as best as they can. They're functioning, you know, at their level of development. They're doing everything they can and it's just not working out right now. So I do agree with your audiologist's recommendation to move forward with an ABR because that will allow you to really get a concrete understanding of what they're able to hear, what they're not able to hear, and that will help you to be able to move forward in thinking about what supports are needed um, to be able to help your child um, continue to develop language, having a very clear idea of what their hearing functioning is like. Sean Renee, what do you think? That's an awesome question. And actually, I'm actually dealing with um, some families with the, in the same situation. So let, let rest assured, you are not alone. Um, I have actually suggested to a family that they actually have the hearing test themselves. So they have arranged to have a hearing exam. They're going to go in with their child. They're not going to say, oh, you're going to see the doctor. It's mommy's turn to see the doctor. And they're going to go in and do the exam themselves. They're not going to discuss it with their child saying, oh, now your turn. They're going to go in, take the test, let the child watch and leave and thank the doctor. Um, and it's just, it was just a suggestion because it seems like sometimes kids don't want to do stuff that they don't see other people do or they don't see their parents do or it's, what are you doing to me? And I think by them seeing that this is going to happen to mom or dad, whomever, um, it might make them, give them a little level of comfort. And I, re I recognize that might not be the best thing for some people's insurance companies, <laughs> but you know, it, it's, a, it's a suggestion. You can always get your hearing <laughs> tested too. That's true. It's always good to have a baseline hearing test. Yeah, thank you for that recommendation. 
Um, I also am aware for other people who might be having similar challenges with their child um, and getting behavioral results in their hearing test or for families who haven't yet had their first hearing test. Um, the University of Colorado at Boulder has an amazing website that shows an actual video of a child in short clips of a child going through the process of a hearing test. So if you wanted to, you could show your child what it looks like, what they what they um, can expect from an otoscope being put in their ear to a tympanogram, to a hearing test, just so that they have some idea of what to expect going into this um, evaluation. And the patients in these videos are kids. So it's almost like I see somebody, like you said, Sean Renee, I see somebody doing this. Now when they go into this room, they have some frame of reference for right. what's about to happen. Exactly. Well, thank you, Cookie. This was really informative. I hope we have answered all of the questions. I don't see anything else in our Q&A box. Oh, wait a minute. We have one more. For little ones under one year old, are ABRs the most accurate form of testing? Thank you for that question. That's a great question. So that question, the answer to your question really depends on where your child is at developmentally. ABR is, for a child that is neurotypical, ABR is typically recommended for a child in the first few months of life. But once a child is around six months old, we have other methods of measuring their hearing threshold levels that are not an ABR. So for example, we'll put your child in a booth. We have some toys to the left and the right. We'll play some sounds from speakers and teach your child that whenever they hear a sound, they should turn to look at the direction that the sound came from. We'll reinforce them for their um, good behavior by lighting up the toys, which essentially teaches them that, hey, this is what I should do. I hear the sound, I turn, I look at the toy, and it'll give me reinforcement. So that's also um, an option for kids who are starting at about six months of age and older. But again, this all depends on the developmental level of your child. So if your child does have some developmental delays or other medical conditions that are going on, it really just depends on where they're at. There are some older kids as well, um, just depending on where they're at, who are not ready yet to participate using visual reinforcement audiometry. And that's okay. You know, we're here to meet you wherever you at, wherever you are at, and use the method of hearing assessment that will meet your child's level of development. Here are the slides again for anybody who wasn't already on the chat when I posted them earlier. Um, before I head out, I just wanted to let you know that if you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I can hear you now. Okay, great. So My contact I, information is in the slides. <laughs> that's awesome. I am so sorry for the difficulties. I think my computer knows it's being replaced and is <laughs> setting up a revolt. <laughs> Um, Cookie said she also put the, the slides in there. 
Um, as an after production part, we'll also send the slides out along with a survey for the um, for the panel to for you all to let us know, you know how you and how you felt about the the activities that we did today. And um, let's see, we're gonna stop that because I can't see you guys. Um, <laughs> So I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to know that the survey is going to come out. Please fill that out. It gives us a chance to know um, what types of, of webinars you guys want to see, if you want to see more, if you want to see less. And um, we appreciate you guys attending. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye.